Hey guys and welcome back and for all you new people my name is Stefano and today we're going to be checking out TP-Link's coming soon 10 gigabit switch. This is the SX3206HPP and this thing has a lot of things that I think you folks in the home lab community would love to actually own. The biggest takeaways from this switch, the things that I like most anyway, is that all four ports are PoE++ and each port is capable of supplying 60 watts of power each. That is a boatload of power. The backplane on this thing also is a, supports up to 120 gigabits per second, so you get that full bandwidth on each port of 10 gig up and down, which is absolutely fantastic. And we have a total of six ports across the board, four of which are RJ45, and the other two are SFP Plus ports. So you can still use those optical transceivers or copper DACs. Since we're on the subject of ports, we might as well just mention the last three technically. We have a console RJ45 port on the front as well as a micro USB. The micro USB is my preferred method from interacting with these switches because I just don't have any computer anymore that carries a serial connection or has a serial port anymore. So USB to micro USB definitely works fine as I have shown you guys in previous videos. And of course, last couple of things to mention about the switch physically is the power port on the rear a grounding connector, as well as a place for Kensington locks should you need. Before I get too carried away, I did wanna show you what comes in the box with this so you know what to expect if you're to buy this on your own. Just so we're clear here, I am not 100% sure if this will be the final version that TP-Link will send out. I do not know if this is actually a review sample, if this is an engineering sample or what, but this is an early release product that is not yet available to everyone. So that is why it's important to show you guys what's in the box. And in the box, of course, which is really cool about this specific unit is the fact that it comes with a rack mountable option. They provide us with rack mount ears, screws and feet should you want to, or should you choose to sit this on your desk. Of course, we have that RJ45 to console uh, cable and as well as a power connector as well, or power cable, whatever you would like to call it. Last but not least, included in the packaging is the installation guide. Always important and nice to have. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and crack this thing open so we can see exactly what is going on on the inside. Check out to see if those fans are replaceable for those of you that want to have this on your desk and are interested in knowing if they can be replaced, um, as well as just seeing what's inside in general. So to open this thing, I think it's fairly simple. There, I see one, two, three, four screws all the way around. Uh, so uh, nothing too complex. I did lie about the number of the screws. There's actually two on each side, two on the rear, and then two on the other side. So there isn't four, there's a total of six. My mistake there. But with the last screw finally being removed, we can have a look at what is on the inside. Like most TP-Link devices, you simply pull back on the lid and lift it away, and then you get direct access to the device itself. Wow, it's got that brand new electronic smell. Oh man, I wish you guys could smell this. It smells phenomenal. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at what's actually uh, hidden inside of here. So just a quick look at this. It looks like this is user serviceable. We have some glue sitting on two three pin connectors on these fans here. Um, these look like they might be smaller than 80 millimeter from a pretty reputable brand. These are 1.44 watt fans, which is cool. One of these is probably the CPU, not sure which one, but looks like we have power coming here from our power supply. Really cool to see the power supply is inside of the case and not some power adapter on the exterior of the case. This looks very well built. I am not an electrical engineer by any means, but from what I have seen in many power supplies, this looks like pretty high quality stuff in here. But again, I'm not an expert. I'm just going off of looks here. Oh, there's some kind of bridge or something. I wonder what this is all for. Interesting. One last quick look around, try to get some good quality shots on these chips as I shake the camera to no end. Sorry, I'm a bit uh, unstable in my hands. I don't have that good grip. Or I guess my grip is fine, I just don't have steady hands. 
Man, I really miss my old freaking <laughs> screwdriver. I'd love to get that back. All right, now with this reassembled, let's go ahead and get it plugged in and I will show you guys how quiet this is and why I believe this will be a great candidate for your desk at home. Now, of course, we don't know what the price is, so that could make this a very um, not so good candidate if it's very expensive, but it is quiet enough to sit on your desk, I believe. And of course, if it's still too loud, you can, or at least it looks like you can replace those two fans inside of here. But enough talking, let's get to it. Okay, so initial boot wise, or was as this thing boots on, it is actually quite loud. And it does eventually quiet down. So you guys should be able to hear it right now. If this was sitting on the desk at this noise level, personally, it wouldn't bother me, but I know a lot of people are a lot more sensitive to noises uh, than I am, but I think in the long run, this is still just too loud, but this is during the boot up process. So I know my test that I'm showing you is not very scientific because we're just using an app from the app store and it's also on a phone, not a device actually made to be measuring the decibels, but nonetheless, I still think it's somewhat accurate or less, at least accurate enough to give you an idea of what to expect if you were to have this at home on your desk. We just have to wait for this thing to finish booting and calm down before I can actually show you the results, right? So evidently at this distance while still booting, we are sitting at about 40 decibels. which is just slightly higher than the noise factor of this room or noise floor of this room. Okay, so it's somewhere between 26 and 27 decibels in the room. And actually it is so quiet that as you may not be able to tell, the fans are actually not spinning. So this system is at an idle state and not under load and it is very quiet because those fans aren't spinning. Now, admittedly, when the fans are spinning, it is still extremely quiet, probably around 34, 35 decibels, and, but that's actually not the annoying part. The annoying part here is actually the coil line that is coming from the fans, I believe. Okay, so let's get this thing operational, start getting a load on it, and see if we can make it make noise on the desk. For those of you unfamiliar, we have Cat6A run throughout the house, and I have a Cat6A Ethernet uh, connection here behind me, and I will be connecting that to one of the RJ45 ports here on this end, if I can get it plugged in, that is. We now need to adopt this device, and once it's adopted, I will connect this directly to my MacBook Pro using a 10 gigabit to Thunderbolt 4 adapter. And on the other end, on the server side, we also have a uh, TP-Link Omada switch that is 10 gig capable, that is also connected to a 10 gigabit E capable switch, or sorry, server that we'll be testing with. Now I wanna point out, this device has been plugged into my network, and once it was plugged in, it actually started making some fan noise. So it's not always completely silent and we haven't even done anything yet. Like I still need to plug in um, this end with the client side. Okay, while we wait for our software to finish updating over there, I just wanted to give you guys another sample of audio. So the switch is not really under load. It's still at idle. It is updating its software as we speak and the audio is about Thirty-two decibels, which I believe is the noise floor of the room itself, when the dogs aren't making noise in the background, at least. So it's still pretty quiet right now. But again, we'll see what happens when we put this thing through some paces. Okay, as you can see here, we have the uh, SX thirty-two hundred six HPP adopted into our Almana controller. Uh, statistics and details wise, or I guess details wise, currently we're using two percent of utilization of the CPU and apparently 30%, 36% of its memory, even though we're not really doing anything and there's no firewalls or routing tables or anything set up. Um, so let's get 
so here's my Unraid server. I have iperf installed on here, iperf3 to be exact. So we will start that up. And then on my Mac, it is 10 gig capable. So we'll be doing a test with 10 parallel transfers. Let's see what happens. And we easily, very easily hit one gigabit per second. Very impressive. Looks like we did, if I'm reading this right, oh no, okay, yeah. So it looks like we averaged 9.43 gigabits per second sending and 9.41 gigabits receiving. Uh, it looks like the st st uh, statistics page might be broken. Uh, currently on this so we'll go back to details and see if we can see uh, the CPU utilization jump up or anything and looks like CP utilization is not changing either it almost seems as if this page is frozen let's see it's down to 1% so that page apparently does not dynamically update which I was not aware of. All right, let's try this one more time. We're looking at a dedicated statistics page within the Omada controller. Um, doesn't appear to be updating at all. This is very strange. Okay, since that page is useless, we're just gonna continue looking at iperf. I'm gonna see if I can get these fans to ramp up at all. We're just gonna run an infinite test, if you will. And I don't know what we'll give out first, the heat on my Intel uh, 10 gig card or the uh, adapter I'm using for my MacBook Pro, will those overheat and eventually slow down? Or will the 10 gig switch finally spin up a little bit louder than it currently is? I don't even know if you guys can hear the switch. It's just off to my left off camera. I don't know if you can hear that, but at its current noise level, that's not something I would that would bother me personally sitting on my desk. Um, although I can understand, you know, people are definitely a lot more sensitive to noise. Um, if I had my headphones on, I don't think I'd hear that at all. And we are approaching the 10 minute mark since I've restarted the test over and over and over. So it's not exactly continuous, but I've observed no change in noise level anyway. If it's not getting any louder by now, I doubt it will, unless it's getting hit on all ports at the same time. But unfortunately, that's um, not something I'm gonna be able to do with my limited amount of hardware. So let's get this thing rack mounted and uh, we'll check out a couple more things on the Amato software controller just to see what we can gleam from this switch currently. All right, we got the switch rack mounted again. We are back in the Amada controller and let's take a look at the software, I suppose. Now we're not obviously in standalone mode. The switch can be used in standalone mode, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're just looking for a 10 gig switch to use at all. And assuming the price on this is good, um, it could be something viable. So what's really cool is we can see the different color schemes here. Um, we are operating on 10 gig a bit on two ports as identified by the color blue, I'm guessing. I am partially colorblind. It looks like it's blue to me. But we also see that in the status, it says 10 gigabit full duplex on there and we can see the transmission bytes on both. Um, obviously we have our serial number, Mac address and more firmware information in this first details page. Uh, let's see what uplink says. Uh, so it our already identified our uplink port port as port five. Very cool. Nothing we had to do there. Showing us information about the uplink device. Nothing too detailed. Um, of course, we have the list of ports, port five being our uplink port. Uh, we have one client, which is PNAS. PNAS is, of course, our project network got attached storage server. Um, this is configuration stuff. Of course, if you wanted to manually update the device, that's where you would do this here. Uh, but we're not too interested in that. Interested in that. The statistic page is kind of updating, but not really. It started to draw there. I'm wondering if that's an issue with Firefox or maybe a bug in the software. Don't know. Uh, 
Unfortunately, there's not really much else information to gleam out of this. We are using a FS DAC, uh, 10 gig DAC, and we don't get to see any information about temperature or firmware or, or any other information about the DAC itself inside of this page, unfortunately. It would be really nice to see, you know, not too big of a deal that it's not there, but that's fine. Yeah, so unfortunately, nothing else to really show here. So I think, I think we're done with this video. I don't really know what else there is to say about this. I know we didn't really deep dive into the specifics of this. Um, there will be reviews from other channels later that will go into all the full details. And if you guys really want to know everything about the Switch, TP-Link does a really good job of actually providing all of the specifications for their equipment online. So definitely check that out if you're more interested and need more information. Um, I just wanted to highlight the things I was most interested, most interested in because I believe most of you are also interested in those similar things. And with all that being said, uh, shout out to TP-Link for sending this over. Also to FS for providing the DAC cable so that way we could test out the switch. And uh, thank you all for watching. So I hope to see you all next time. Peace.